Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Trofin at the Babbling Belgian, and welcome back to Gwentech, where we today are going to be talking about the very new cards that just arrived in the Harvest of Sorrows expansion, the part, the third and final part of the Price of Power expansion, which um, has a lot of very special cards that have been added. Balance is kind of out of the window um, in this patch, but uh, we're going to go through each and every single card that has been added in detail. Talking a bit about the interactions that they have with the existing cards um, and maybe a little bit of lore. We'll see um, how far I dive into that. And that of course means that we're going into the deck builder. We're going to be mostly for this entire video going to be here and we'll just go through the cards one by one. I'm going to start at the bottom as I usually do because uh, yeah it's just more interesting to work our way up to the more powerful cards. First up is basically the Joker. Um, the Illusionist is a, a Nilf card, 4 provision card of uh, 3 power and on deploy he spawns a base copy of a bronze unit from your opponent's graveyard on the right side of this card and sets it power to 1. So not triggering a simulate because you spawn a unit but of course you can get any sort of engine from your opponent and uh, put it right next to you. If you are bonded so there is already an Illusionist on the board you don't set its power to 1 and just spawn it as is. So for example, if that's a griffin, then you get 12 points out of this illusionist, which is very, very powerful indeed. And the card art is just amazing. That's going to be a running team with this expansion. Uh, most of the cards just look incredible. Look at that. Just a, just a joker in the middle here with uh, yeah some illusory soldiers i suppose which he's controlling with these like figures in his hand it's just really nicely done and we have syndicate the savvy huckster uh, four provisions as well for power one profit and on deploy you damage an enemy unit by one if he's bonded so if there's another one on the board already you increase the profit and the damage by one um, so giving you two coins and two damage for eight points on the bonded unit. So that's going to be basically the team that we're going with with the four provision cards. They're all going to have bonded or most of them are going to have bonded. And they will, if you have two of them, will almost always just go around 14, 15 points in total. Then we have probably the most powerful four provision card in this bunch. The Meditating Mage has patience, of course, so the uh, order value will increase at the end of every one of your turns. He has four power for four provisions and his order ability allows him to gain vitality for X amount of turns, so the patience value amount of turns. If you are bonded, however, when you use your order ability, you also gain resilience on this card. So if you have an army of these things on the board, then all of them will gain resilience. If you use um, the Saya at the end of your next round, then you will reset all their order abilities. They will have gained in power because Vitality sticks on the resilience units for some reason. Um, so they will have a higher power. And then you can trigger all those order abilities again since their patience value will still be the same, and they gain resilience again. So you can keep all your meditating mages throughout the entire game, which I think for a 4 provision card is just way too overpowered. This will see a nerf really, really quickly. No 4 provision card should have resilience. That's not that's not really the way to go, I think. There we have the Watcher of the Valley, Squirtel, an L for 4 power, 4 provisions as well. On deploy, you give an enemy unit bleeding equal to the amount of boost on this card. So Squirtel are going heavy into the hand boosting archetype for this bit of the expansion. And if this card is bonded, instead of applying bleeding, you damage the unit by the amount you are boosted instead. So basically giving you a, um, well, a bronze Sheldon Skaggs, but of course you need to have all, one already on the board. Then for monsters, the lesser witch, 5 power for 4 provisions. Of course, this is a relic. Um, on deploy, you spawn a base copy of yourself in the graveyard. So giving you a 5 point card in your graveyard. But if she is bonded, you spawn that copy on her row instead. So giving you 10 points for a total, of course, of 15 points if you play both units. So simple, high power. That's just the way monster rolls. And we have Skalliga. Skalliga is really extremely powerful with the new addition. So little Hafru, uh, remember the Hafru singer? So that was a bard that was singing to the Hafru's. And this is, uh, yeah, the, um, the, 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 the beast itself. So the siren itself. Little Hafru, six power for four provisions. And on deploy, you increase this card's base power by two if it is bonded. So if you have one already on the board, that will be 8. So again, giving you 8 and 6 is 14 points for the two bonded units. 
But she also has a, an order ability that basically mirrors Melusine's order ability, where you damage yourself by four and spawn rain for two turns on an enemy row. So it doesn't need to be the opposite row, you can choose whatever row you want, which is gonna be very important if you play this card. But very powerful in a rain deck, as you'll see with the other cards in a minute. Then we're going up a tier, so now we have the Incubus, 5 power for 5 provisions, 4 monsters, deploy a summon a bronze unit from your opponent's graveyard to the opposite row, and then summon a bronze unit of equal or less provisions from your graveyard to this row. It is summoning, so again, not playing, so you can, again, get a griffin out of the graveyard and summon it without actually applying Doom, so you keep that card. Um, the reason why this might be powerful is, of course, one, it's a relic. Second, um, monsters usually have a lot higher base power than uh, any other faction. So if you get a 5 provision bronze from your opponent on the board, that might be just something that has a deployability but doesn't have much power in its own right. So for example, 3 power. And then you give yourself the griffin, giving you 6 points over your opponent, which is just uh, possibly really powerful. But yeah, again... I it's going to be really conditional based on what your opponent has in the graveyard. Then probably one of the more bullshit cards that have been added in this expansion, the Imperial Practitioner. Five power for five provisions has assimilate, so you would think that I really like this card, but on order you spawn a base copy of the last card that went to your opponent's graveyard on top of your deck. If you have a lot of them on the board, you can trigger all the order abilities at once, giving you the same card on top of your deck every single time. Why is this bush bullshit? Well, there's another card in this expansion, and for once I'm gonna actually go directly to that card. So there we have Viljeforts in his prime, Viljeforts Renegade, also a Nilfgaard card, of course, 6 power for 13 provisions, and it is warranted because on deploy you swap a card from your opponent's graveyard with a card in your hand. Usually this sounds like you would want to grab something very powerful from your opponent's graveyard and swap it out for something crappy from your hand. But the way this card is mostly used is with the practitioners we just saw. So the practic practitioner allows you to on order grab a copy of the last card that went in your opponent's graveyard and put it on top of your deck. What a lot of players these days are now doing, since yesterday of course, is have Masquerade Ball in their hand, they can do that with Matahuri, and then use Viljeforce Renegade to put that Masquerade Ball on top of the opponent's graveyard and get whatever out of that graveyard. I don't think they even care at that point. But then use all the practitioners. If they have five on the board, they have five Masquerade Balls on top of their deck, which is ridiculous. Um, the whole point of giving scenarios doomed was to avoid having to play, uh, being able to play scenarios multiple times. And yeah, this has been completely broken with this combo between Viljeforts and the Practitioner. Um, I don't know why they did this, because there's been some questions about this, if this is intended. And the developers themselves did answer that it is an intended interaction. But then I don't know why scenarios were doomed in the first place, because that change has been completely neutralized now. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's just insane this combo i really don't like the fact that you can do that now i like the effect just the fact that you can get one of the powerful cards that you destroyed from your opponent in your hand that is cool but being able to do multiple scenarios in a row is just ridiculous but yeah we were looking at bronze cards so let's go back to syndicate purge a crime where you damage an enemy unit by three increase the damage by one for every witch hunter on your side of the battlefield and if you kill the unit with that damage, you place a bounty on the highest power enemy unit. This basically makes payday redundant if you use Witch Hunters. Because you can go way higher damage wise. Um, and if you kill it, you get a bounty on top of that as well. So Purge is really, really powerful. I love the card art as well, by the way. I don't know. They're using like some sort of magic webbing. Because you can see the... Um, oh no, it's it's probably going to be... Because that's a Doppler. They have a Doppler called in their net. Um, so I'm assuming it's a silver net. Where you can see that the Doppler is, can't change anymore. And that's basically what the silver does. Because um, in one of the stories, uh, Geralt does something similar. Uh, so I'm guessing... Although the, the web looks like really sticky. So I don't know. It might be Dimeridium instead as well. Because there's like sparks all over the place. Because um, it is limiting the Doppler's ability, clearly. It's, it's trying to change. You can see that on the animated card, but it can't do it. Okay, enough lore. Let's get on to it to, with the next cards. And now one of my favorite new artworks, the Alumni. I love this card art. 
This is just amazing. So four power for six provisions for Northern Realms. Of course, you on deploy. If both values are equal or higher than four, gain seal. But of course, that means that we have basically one of the biggest descriptions of any cards available. Um, this card combines the Banard student and the Arthusa student. So on, if you put them on the melee row, you get the damage in enemy unit by zero. If you put them on the ranged row, they boost an allied unit by zero. The value that that ability has corresponds to the highest patience achieved by any of your Banard students or Arthusa students. So if your highest Banard student was eight damage, then this melee ability will be eight. If the Arthusa student was at six, for example, then that ranged ability will be six. And that brings us back to the first line. So on deploy, this also decides whether you gain zeal or not. If both of them are higher than four or equal, uh, you gain zeal and can use this ability immediately. This card itself doesn't have patience, so it doesn't keep increasing, um, I think, although it might actually, because it still corresponds to the highest patience value. So if one of your other students actually increase, they will increase as well. This is a bronze card, so that means that it comes into the pool of Runeward, which could be potentially very powerful. Um, it can also be copied by whatever you want, so Adalia, reinforcements, stuff like that can be resurrected by Necromancy. So, very good card in that front, and I so love the card art. I mean, so basically it's the graduated versions of the students. You can even see that the, the male version is in the same position as the student, although it looks a lot more refined, the fire looks like a lot more delineated, so they mastered that craft. Uh, sadly, the Aratusa student isn't doing something similar, but now has like a protective charm on the ground. So really, really awesome card. I, I, I think this is my favorite card art-wise from the, uh, the expansion now. There we have another very powerful addition to the Skellige Beast Rain archetype. So the Messenger of the Sea, four power for six provisions, which sounds hefty, but uh, she's basically Dagur. Because um, whenever rain or storm damages enemy units, you boost yourself by the damage dealt. Um, this is a Siren, and I think she has like octopus tentacles instead of like a normal fishy tail. Um, a cute little nightmare is the flavor text, which seems apt. Yeah, she looks a bit... Creepy. But it synchronizes very well if you have a lot of rain or storm on the board. Especially with storm, because every single unit that is hit, the points you get from that will be doubled up. And it synchronizes very well with the gold cards for Skellige, which we'll be talking about in a minute. Then we have the rare Squiretel card, a nature card with six provisions, which also makes it very interesting for a whole host of reasons. But you create and play a bronze Dol Bloodthana elf, and then depending on the position of the chosen unit, you boost the leftmost, random or rightmost unit in your hand by two. What does that mean? Well. You see the selection of cards you can get from this here. Uh, what this means is, for example, if you get the choice between the Archer, the Sentry and the Sorceress, they will decide that you, so the, the Archer will be on the left, the Sentry will be in the middle and the Dolblatana Sorceress will be on the right. So if you choose the Archer, you will boost the leftmost card in your hand by two. If you choose the Sorceress, you will boost the rightmost card in your hand by two and the Sentry takes the middle spot. So that is just the explanation of something that sounds really, really confusing. So basically, it allows you to play an elk's extra elf and get some hand boosting in return. This could be a five provision elf. That's basically the limit on that. So you do gain those two extra points in hand boosting are basically that extra point of provision. But of course, you do play a nature card, you do play an elf, and possibly even another nature card, because of course, the sorceress of Dolblatana could also give you another special card. It's a very powerful card if you get lucky with what you draw and just gels very well with the nature elf deck if you want to build something like that. And then we get one of the neutral cards. So basically a uh, six power card for seven provisions. Alyssa Hansen, who has called the, uh, well, the new syndicate family that we've seen, the Witcher, witch hunter family. So she's finally taking revenge. On deploy, you shuffle a special card from your graveyard to your deck. If it was a bronze, also shuffle one additional copy of that special, basically giving you more support for Simlas. Uh, so for example, if you played um, a lot of extra waylays with Vanadane, for example, you could put all the waylays that you've played back into your deck using Alyssa, and then using Simlas, you can play every single waylay you've played so far again. 
So very, very extremely powerful card in that sense. I'm sure there are other options to use this on, especially because basically this is the first time that we get something that Nilfgaard has been able to do for a long time already, because Nilfgaard has always been able to um, put cards from their own graveyard back into your deck or from your opponent's graveyard back into the deck. That has no limit, but this uh, is limited to special cards, but still allows you to, for example, put um, something like Renew back into your deck Waters of Broccolon, for example, also a very good example for that. Um, just the, all the gold special cards can be a good target for Alyssa Hansen. And there's definitely a good use for her in finally something else in Nilfgaard. And then we get Octavia Hale, 7 power for 7 provisions. If you don't recognize her, she is actually the same character as the Witch Finder. So they just gave every um, well member of the Hale family a different name because as you can see we also got a uh, separate I think Fabian is supposed to be the scoundrel then because they have the same like tattoos on their face and then Ignatius Hale is supposed to be the brute so they all have like this almost superhero persona where they they are a family of witch hunters but when they go out on the street they go by their moniker um, which is really, really cool. But Octavia Hale, on deploy, you draw up to two of Octavia's sons to your hand and then shuffle back the same number of cards. So basically allowing to, you to put the Brute and the Scoundrel in your hand if you don't have them yet. The uh, Yeah, the, the named versions aren't as powerful as definitely the, uh, the higher provision cards. And then I think one of the funniest cards that have been added, another Squirtel card, the Squirtel Epic Torque. Uh, if you have read the books or watched the series of uh, The Witcher, by the way, on Netflix, you know who this guy is. So he's a Sylvan. I think he's portrayed a little bit too skinny to be a Sylvan in accordance to CDPR's um, actual design of the Sylvans. But four power for eight provisions. Whenever this card is boosted in your hand, boost a random different unit in your hand by the same amount. And if you have Devotion, so you don't have any neutral cards in your deck, this card always starts in your hand. Very, very powerful. So every single hand boosting should go to Torque because he basically doubles up any sort of hand boosting you can do. Um, on top of that, that also means that he can triple hand boosting. Because if he puts the second boost on something like Sheldon Skaggs or Aglaïs, you basically double that up again. Uh, or even the uh, Watcher of the Boar... Uh, or the, that, that's a different game, the Watcher of the Boreal Valley. The Watcher of the Valley, just the Valley, it's still Platana, but whatever. Um, so yeah, very, very good support for hand boosting and something that your opponent can't really counter. Uh, unless, of course, when you finally play him, he's going to be really big. Uh, but uh, yeah, before that, your opponent can almost not do anything uh, aside from Nilfgaard, obviously, with the uh, Shilard, where they can put a uh, unit in your hand to one. But yeah, Torque, very fun card to play with. I've played a few matches with him already, and he's just a lot of fun. And then we get one of the more problematic cards in the expansion, I think. Ryogan the Undying. 8 power for 8 provisions, and this card starts in your graveyard. So basically giving you a little bit of tinning. But you want to banish this thing. If you play against Skellige, please for the love of god, banish this thing. Uh, I've played one match where I got nuked. With a 120 point point swing, I am not kidding you, with one card. And it involved this guy and the legendary Skellige card. I'll talk about that in a minute. But when you play or summon him from the graveyard, you trigger all remaining rain and storm on the opponent's side of the field in one go. It's not just one turn, you trigger everything. So what happened with me was they resurrected Ryogam. I was playing monsters. I had a pretty filled row, and they used the hu little Huffroos from before um, to get a bunch of rain on one that one single row, then use Fulmar to change that into Storm, and then resurrected Ryogan to trigger eight turns of Storm in one go. That was about 80 points on its own, but of course there was also one of those messengers on the board which gave them extra points for every tick of damage that was going on. 
So it must have not been just 80 points, it might have been less because of the fact that certain units were dying before the storm completely hit them. Uh, so for example, say that it was like 50, 60 points, then the messenger got the equal amount of points on top of that, and then Ryagon is 8 points, and then of course the uh, the card that resurrected this also is 5 points. So that was over 120 points in difference. Um, yeah, this card is just insane. I'll probably do a deck guide about this just to show off the combo. Because it's really powerful, but expect to be countered a lot by this. Um, so that you should always be prepared with a uh, banish from the graveyard. Because uh, if this is just banished over the course of the match, your opponent can't do that combo anymore. Then the Northern Realms card is also very interesting, the epic uh, Rafford's Vengeance, which is a machine, a mage and a siege engine all in one for 5 power, 9 provisions. And on order you play a bronze unit from your hand and then draw a card with a 5 turn cooldown. Of course with Winch that means that you can pretty quickly do this again every 2 turns I think if I calculate that correctly. If you have crew then uh, so if you're flanked by soldiers but in this case also mages because mages contribute to this card's crew ability then whenever you play a unit next to this card you damage a random enemy unit by two on top of that so just by default you can play a bronze unit from your hand if you just use inspired zeal on top of this and then every time you play something next to it you will damage something by two and every five turns you can play another card from your hand so it is this is insane um because you can just smack down so many mages on the board with this. Um, especially if you combine that with the meditating mages. This could be very, very powerful. And then probably the most interesting cards lore-wise. I'll talk about that in a minute. And that's really the reason why I wanted this card in the animated form. Because you saw it happen already. Lydia van Bredevoort. The uh, assistant of um, Viljevoort. If you don't know who this is. 5 power for 9 provisions. On deploy. If you put her on the melee row. You create and play a brawn special card from your opponent's faction. So basically giving you some assimilate triggers. And on the range row, you play a uh, bronze special card from your opponent's graveyard instead. So basically, the experimental remedy card with a body. Um, very, very possibly powerful card in an assimilate deck. But the real reason I want to talk about this card is the thing that you see happening with her face. Um, Lydia was actually the victim of a um, experiment gone wrong. Something that Viltefort almost, well, basically forced her to do. So she lost most of the bottom part of her face, so her jaw is completely mangled. Um, and to fix that, she basically conjures up a permanent illusion. So her face doesn't emote anymore, she doesn't really talk or do something with her mouth anymore. So she has to emote with her eyes, because the bottom of her face is an illusion. Um, which is, was really fitting when she eventually died in this story uh, because of course the illusion fell away and then it, her horrible real face was revealed the horrible mutilation that was wrought upon her by Viltrefort. But yeah, very tragic story and as the, uh, the, story, the, the card also depicts by the way it doesn't only do that with the animated version because if you look in the back here you can see the mirror, I think it's supposed to be a mirror, cracking on her face, just indicating, okay, her face is, um, yeah, has been horribly mutilated. You can actually see her uh, nectus also changing to reactivate the illusion. So it's it's just a very, very thoughtful, thoughtfully made card with respect to all the lore. So it's amazing. And now we have the neutral location card, which also is very, very powerful, especially in an alchemy deck. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. The mushy truffle. Resilience, of course, because it is a location. On deploy, you spawn and play a bonded unit from your starting deck. So you play a copy of it, by the way. And that also means that you can just double up on any of the bronze cards that we just saw, including, of course, the meditating mage, which could give you even more resilience. And then on order, you spawn and play golden fraud. So that's an alchemy card, basically giving you another alchemy card you could use um the um what's her name the uh, one of the druids that actually boosts herself by one or two for each alchemy card you play that's a bonded unit you can put that on the board and then play golden fraud right afterwards boosting her even further so mushy truffle has a lot of uses and you'll see that card a lot when you're playing this game and then the final epic card for monsters, the organic special card, which is Sabbath. Summon up to three highest power units from your opponent's graveyard to an enemy row. And then summon as many highest power monster units from your graveyard to the opposite row and give them doomed. 
basically because the i've seen this in action once already um this does not mean that they need to be the same power this card just summons the three highest units from both graveyards to both rows so if you have set this up with something big then yeah you can definitely outclass your opponent points wise uh, it is also an organic card so this will trigger the uh, Arca swarm ability as well um, but yeah this could be very powerful if you have a lot of high power units in your graveyard i think the one thing you need to be careful about is Vigern. i'm not sure if they still have their armor if they summoned like this so a lot of cards could actually die on contact if you use this. But uh, yeah, that's something we'll need to experiment with. And now we get to the fancy legendary cards. Of course, um, as I said, Squirtel focuses on hand boosting. So Villa Vandrel was the leader that could do hand boosting. Starts at 4 power for 12 provisions. I think the provisions are a bit too high for this card. But on the ploy, if you put them on the melee road, you create and play a Squirtel special card with a provision cost equal to this unit's power. Or if you put it on the range row, you can also play uh, special cards that are lower than his power. Um, the reason why they do this is just in case you would have boosted him too high. Because if you go uh, over 12, then there's nothing left for you to play. Because 12 is Jorvitz Gambit and what is a Broccolon. But above that, there's no uh, Squirtel special card anymore. So you need to put him on the range row. So basically giving you extra points depending on how many boosts he got in hand could be powerful but i feel like his provisions are a bit too high um because there are better options to play for lower provisions to play uh guaranteed cards like for example force protector now is really powerful because you can now also get the uh, six provision bronze that we just talked about back from the graveyard to play another elf so very powerful uh that way but villa vandrel i think his provisions are a bit too high to give you the um yeah the, the the benefit for it then the monster card 13 provisions as you see we're already at 13 provisions so that means that the five remaining legendary cards are all 13 provisions or higher this is the witch queen basically but she starts at one power um she only gains zeal if you have sabbath but her order ability allows you to consume a 4 provision unit and then increase the provision value by 1. And you can do that every 2 turns. So it's a really weird ability. So it's basically the Sihil uh, type of play where you can only use the ability every 2 turns. But you can only get zeal if you have Sabbath. So meaning that you need to play a couple of cards before you can actually play Yaga. And then, of course, reduces the amount of points that you could get with the consumability. The power of this card lies in the fact that you can consume... Jesus Christ, that wasn't a word anymore. Uh, that you can consume a unit from your opponents, since it doesn't indicate that it needs to be a unit from your side of the board. So that's the power. So, for example, if you consume a four power unit from your opponent at the start, that also already gives you nine points. If you do two turns later, a five power card that gives you another 10 points. So that is 19 points after two turns. So sounds really powerful. But of course, this is really, really fragile. It's one power. So just one long ship on the other side of the board. And this card dies on contact, um, which is weird because, of course, this thing is huge. It should have more power than this, but yeah, it's just to fit in the lore related ability because the Witch Queen was somebody who just ate everything that she came across and then at a certain point she couldn't... Yeah, it's what the text says. For centuries she feasted until one day she could no longer stand at all and so she ate some more and that's why she looks like that. But yeah, a very horrifying card by the way, just from the artwork and, and just a little kid over there with the skull in his hands gives me the shivers but yeah on to the next one yeah the very nice words i have to say about this card that basically tells me to fuck off um yeah <laughs> the the name of this card is is fukusia but if you are somebody who likes to use dirty words this card basically tells you to fuck you see you um but yeah beast 5 power, 30 provisions, and on deploy you play a Skellige unit from your graveyard with a provision cost of 10 or less, give it doomed and spawn rain on the opposite row with a duration equal to the unused provisions. So you can see him on the card as well, so Ryogan, um, he's on here as well, so that indicates, okay, please use this card to resurrect Ryogan. Um, that gives you 2 extra turns of rain, so 4 more points that Ryogan will trigger, but as I said before, 
this just allows you to stack a lot of rain, a lot of storm in your opponent's side of the board. Then play Fukushima, resurrect Rio Gun, and just whack clean your entire opponent's board. It's just, it was gone at that point. My board, I think I had 10 points left on the board. That was it. Everything else was washed away by Fukushima and Rio Gun. The uh, amazing combo. The 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 card art again is gorgeous. Um, but the combo with Ryogon is just insane. It just requires you to have a banish in your deck, because otherwise you will lose. You will lose. There's just so many ways to apply rain now from a Skellige deck that this will be so many points. So many points. Now we have Syndicate for once, not the strongest cards in the expansion. The Brute 6 power for 13 provisions, 0 profit, 0 boost, but the boost is equal to the base power of the last destroyed enemy unit with a bounty. So for example, if you kill the Griffin, that's 9 points that he will boost himself by, giving you 15 points already. But whenever you place a bounty on an enemy unit, you also increase this unit's profit by 1. So if you've played 8 bounties over the course of the match, you will get, gain 8 coins on top of that as well. So basically a way better Ignatius Hail because this is Ignatius Hail. Again, they just use the moniker uh, in their stronger versions of the cards because they're all legendaries right now. Scandal is, uh, Ignatius is, and so the Brute and the Witchfinder of course. So all three have the legendaries. And um, Octavia is actually the leader skin, which yeah, I have a problem with that. The reason why they didn't tell us beforehand what the leader skin was, was apparently for spoilers. Um, but the Witchfinder was what the very first Syndicate Legendary we got revealed, so that doesn't make any sense. Um, okay, it might be a spoiler that the Witchfinder is also the mother of the Halo Brothers. But, yeah, that, that, I mean, come on. And it is, of course, faction specific, which was something I also uh, indicated already. So yeah, that leader skin, not the biggest fan of it. It looks cool, but not the biggest fan of how that was handled. So then we got Vilja Forts, we talked about that already. And then the final card is of course for Northern Realms, which I think is one of the more um, just plain strong cards, not too overpowered strong cards. So the Chapter of Wizards, another location card, but for 13 provisions now. On the ploy you spawn and play Runeward, so spell, mage, and possibly another spell, if you play this right. Um, and on order, you spawn the base copy of uh, a base copy of the last played allied bronze mage on this row. So giving you possibly another alumni, um, possibly yeah anything else. You you can play with that. But I think alumni is going to be the strongest card to use it on because that will already have the patience value of your opponent uh, of your uh, students. So that's going to be the most amount of points. So really, really powerful. Uh, you could even reset the order ability with Dwim Viandra and get another alumni if you want to. Um, but of course, then you need to have played another alumni next because um, otherwise you just replay. Wait. Oh no, it's spawning. Luckily. I was just thinking, if you could play the copy, a copy of the last played Allied Bronze Mage, could you just copy Dwim Viandra constantly? But no, she has a deployability and this is spawning. So never mind. But yeah, alumni, give that zeal and just smack your opponent immediately. Because uh, the zeal is applied on deploy, so that's not going to help otherwise. But that was the final card in the um, in the expansion pack that we had now. Uh, a lot of very powerful combos, as I just stated. Um, some of them possibly even too overpowered, but we'll see how the meta evolves um, when we use this. But now we're actually done with the entire expansion. Th these are all the cards that were in there. Um, I'm actually thinking about doing a lore specific card review because I have a lot of things to say about how the order of the cards were handled because I feel like they made a few problems they created a few problems with that um, lore wise um, if you're interested in that let me know because I, I really want to do that but if nobody's interested then why would I even do that so uh, let me know if you're interested in that and then I'll get to work on that and that's it for this video we'll, we'll, we will of course be doing a lot of deck guides with these new cards um because there's just a lot of crazy combos that you really want to see in action uh, to see what you can do with that so you can reproduce that on your own and uh, have a lot of fun with these new archetypes so yeah um i think the the overall focus of the expansion was pretty clear for syndicate that was more support for bounties for northern realms that was of course mages and patience for squirtel it was hand boosting but also a lot of spells so that was 
less focused, I think, than the other factions. Monsters, of course, relics, the ever-hated relics. Um, Nilfgaard basically assimilate um, and a lot of uh, deck and graveyard manipulation, which is really, really interesting. And then Skellige, clearly um, Beasts and Rain slash Storm, so that was basically the main theme for that. And a bit of self-wounding uh, on top of that. So the focus of the, the cards was really good, aside from maybe Squirtel, which was a little less focused. I would have liked to see a lot more hand-boosting focus instead of what we got. But still, we got a few very interesting cards overall in the expansion. So, uh, yeah, let's go out and play some more games with these new cards. Because, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to doing the, the deck cards uh, in this month. It is a shorter season, by the way. We only have oh, a little over 20 days, so uh, 22 days. Um, and as you see, I, I'm still at rank 4 because I didn't manage to get pro because of my wedding last month. Um, so, uh, we're going to be... Yeah, we have a lot of work ahead of us. So uh, thank you enormously for watching. And I'll see you in the next video um, of Quantage. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and stay nutty.